Okay, this is Fiesta. Fiesta, 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 fiesta party. So, I'm at the State Fair of Texas, here in Dallas, where I've lived most of my life, and I'm looking up at this giant cowboy, and I'm wondering how to sum up this city in a couple of images. That's why I'm here with a camera, scouting the fairgrounds for a scene that really represents the feeling of Dallas. But I don't feel like Big Tex is the kind of thing I'm looking for. He's sort of the opposite of what I want. It's just too iconic and immediately recognizable. I'm after something that looks the way I feel when I think of my hometown. This is better. This seems somehow more like the tone of Dallas, I think. At least the way I see it. The crowd is really diverse. Mexican culture is being presented and appreciated. Something key to Dallas. And it's strange and beautiful. It's hard to pin down what it is about Dallas. It's many things all at once. I've been thinking about how to capture the feeling of a city because I'm about to visit Portland, Oregon. I've never been there before, and I'm curious what it is about that place that seems to be so attractive. You've probably heard people talk about it. Maybe you've been there or have friends who have and love it. I have a handful of friends who have moved there. Texan transplants who seem to see it as a haven for artists. All of these friends are doing something creative there. Remember the guy singing Fiesta during the opening credits? That's my friend Blake Mackey. He's from Dallas and now lives in Portland. I'm flying up there to film him playing his songs. And while I'm there, I want to figure out what it is that draws people in. I arrive in Portland and meet up with Blake. He shows me around his neighborhood and almost immediately hops into a tree to play me a song, which really is the main reason I'm here. Oh, God has given us many years here. Now we must part. And as the angels come and call for you, the pains of grief tug at my heart. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling. My heart breaks as you take your long journey. <laughs> One of the first things I noticed is the small town feel, and it's very pretty. We meet up with Blake's girlfriend, Susie, who also moved here from Dallas. We stop by a corner store. 
I am taken aback by the massive beer selection, and the world music adds the kind of unique touch I was expecting to find in this town. We browse around, and eventually I buy plenty to drink. Well, you, you, know, you moved here from Dallas, right? Do you, you, know, do you know more people who moved here from Texas? Um, yeah, there's like a whole crew of Denton and Austin people that are out here. And like, practically none of them have any family out here, right? Yeah, they all just kind of came out here either for like cheap drugs or music, almost. And uh, drugs are like half the price. Then, uh, yeah, there's tons of transplants out here from the Midwest. I know a lot of people from Illinois, a lot of people from Texas. Minnesota. A lot of people from Minnesota, and a lot of people from California. But also a lot of people come out for music, not just drugs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah music. And art. Also. They hear that's a really great biking city, yeah. which it is. It's really fun. The biking out here is awesome, and... Uh, As I mentioned before, everyone I know here is an artist of some sort. I ask Susie to show me her drawings, some of which are cover art for Blake's albums. Um, this is a self-portrait hand, or my own hand that I drew. I did like a study, and I went all out and really detailed the color. So you can see like the shadow of the thumb on the hand and the shadows within the hand of the fingers on themselves and like the creases and the crease of the sweater that I was wearing at the time. It's that one. Oh yeah, here's one I did of Blake. <laughs> he says it looks like him, like the Asian version of him, but it's not really Asian. He was like squinting the whole time because he was looking at his computer and I was just like, okay, try not to draw him squinting and then that turned out. <laughs> It's all Prismacolor and um, black pen outlining it. Dragon Ball Z or something. Um, then I have this one. I did this one. Um, I think it has the date on the back. I mean, not. It, I did this on December 6th of 2007. So this one's pretty old, maybe two years ago. This other one, which is also from that time period, two years ago, it's really... It screams LSD. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think about it every time I bust this one out because everybody's like, whoa, what were you tripping on when you did that? I'm like, uh, nothing. I just did it. Some random, some random drawing that I, I kind of like. I don't know. I haven't completed it, I don't think. Um, I'll maybe talk about this one. This is like the common Eschaton cover, the original. I did this um, completed on October 30th of 2007. So this is from way long ago. I guess not way long ago, but the la I guess this is your newest album CD image or album image that I drew. I really like the fine detailing that I just I just try to make like everything have a pattern. It's in the with like the background as well, just so there's a lot of movement going on in there, and people have something to look at. Hmm. Can you tell me about the idea. Um, Blake wanted himself to be in uh, Native American regalia, and he wanted to be holding a guitar and his him this like hymnal book like his grandma gave him so I kind of drew that representing that and um, I added a pentagram to the guitar in a Ouroboros right here and then he wanted like the dual night and well, night and day kind of background and yeah he gave me the idea and black black demon wings so <laughs> I have not noticed that until now yeah it's awesome it's a, the greatest idea I think I enjoyed drawing this too. So. Is it time for one quick one? Maybe? One quick one? Uh, my name is Blake Mackey again, and this is my last song. Blake Mackey!
this me normally, or am I just tripping? You guys are the first people to actually laugh at that. It's a joke. I'm Blake Mackey. Thank you. After Blake plays an open mic set with a good crowd response, the three of us partake in a popular Portland pastime, beer drinking. That's me, by the way. This nine pound hammer. Yeah, it's a little too heavy. A honey for my size. A honey for my size. I'm going up on the mountain. I'm gonna see my baby. Oh, I ain't this is being shot by a fellow filmmaker friend of mine. No, I ain't That's him, back. Troy. He is also a Texan transplant artist living here in Portland. I'll be staying at his place tonight in order to help him with a video shoot in the morning. His movie Pickled is currently in production. I should explain that his actual name is Monty Wayne Benton III, and because he is the third, he went as simply Trey for years. Then he tried to switch to his first name, Monty, which only half caught on, so he eventually combined Monty and Trey into his current moniker, Monty Trey. I, however, rarely call him any of these names. I almost always call him Troy. There is no good reason for this. The following morning, I accompany Troy to Mount Tabor State Park where he is shooting his movie. The view from up here is stunning. This morning, I first experienced the kind of natural beauty that so many have bragged about. This mountain slash dormant volcano is within city limits. It's so close to everything, and it's absolutely amazing. We're only right at the entrance, and this is the view of downtown. It's a cold, windy day, but I notice a couple of people jogging in shorts. This makes me feel kind of foreign and very cold. I'm going up north, I'm going up north this fall If love don't change, I won't be back at all my honey, babe I'm leaving you I'm impressed with Troy's dedicated cast and crew. Shortly after 8 a.m., they all begin to arrive and assist in various tasks. He really has a great team here in Portland. I immediately notice how much smoother things are going on this set, as opposed to his first film shoot in Denton, Texas. There, he utilized the help of friends, and it wasn't like this. This is pretty organized, almost professional, to be honest. Cool. Yeah, it's just a stable thing, something we can like, just move our heads up to. What are we doing? We're doing a puppet scene, and uh, what we're doing is not showing from the neck down, so that way people don't have to, like... Well, it's, it's a lot harder with the clothes, but the heads, it just goes by way faster. And... Um, it's the death scene. This is the end scene where everybody dies. And um, that's, that's it. That's what we're doing. These are the, you want to tell me real quickly what, what this is all for? This is for the movie Pickled. It's, uh, it's my second feature film. And it's a tragic horror comedy. Uh, it's probably going to be about 60 to 75 minutes Beautiful long. You get there. And uh, it's, very, it's very silly. And the reason why I cast puppets in it is because you don't have to feed puppets. You don't have to clothe puppets. Um, you don't have to uh, 
pay for puppets lodging. You don't have to pay puppets for acting. And no matter what, you always get the shot right with the puppet. There's no, okay, let's do that a fifth time. I watch as the crew sets up for a scene, and being familiar with the work of Monty Trey, I am not at all surprised by what I see, even when fake blood and orange soda are simultaneously flung at a puppet in front of an old ambulance. Okay, go ahead. This movie is going to be very weird. Go off. Ah. <laughs> now, I've had trouble explaining this movie to people, but his synopsis is just ridiculous. I dare you to try and follow it. I've read the script, and I still have no idea what it's about. So, the project you're working on right now is called Pickle? You want yes. To it? I'll try my best. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you the synopsis. And it is a film about two twin brothers, or just twin brothers, that are scouting locations for their newest film in the woods, but it's the Amazon. Yeah, that's what they're looking to get done. And then they're attacked by this wild animal. But it could be two wild animals. And then there's this dead woman that they kill, maybe. And then there might have been some gunshots, because where'd the rifle come, and where'd the, where'd the hunter come from, and is there, is there a hunter, and who was the woman? And so they're, like, thrust into this situation where they have to sustain not only their lives, but the people that they encounter, like a veterinarian who helps take care of this panther that they accidentally run on over, you know, they, but there could, there's two of them, you know, possibly, there could be more, and, and he falls in love with her, and then there's these two medics that show up, and these two flamboyant detectives, and in the end it's just this tragic horror comedy, it's very colorful, and there are puppets, and ridiculous outfits, and hairdos, and Wait, wait, you see me duck, and then you go, okay? Lord, Here's what God. I want to do, is I want to pan back over. As he's, as he's looking over, yeah. I want to pan over, and you're still looking. Oh, he's gone. Then you think for a second and look over. Okay. So don't... So there, and I'm, I'm still here? Just, yeah, until stay see, looking. Until you just, see me gone, don't even think about, like, looking. Okay. And then when I come back over, then we see you look over. Mm -hmm. I gotta get out of here. I help out with some of the Perfect. shots, yeah. and the wind continues, and there's still no sun. And I grow kind of weary. Luckily, Blake shows up, and it's time to proceed with our movie as he plays some songs on the mountain. Oh, she loves my baby! Baby? What? Just for a kiss or two. 
He's been playing these traditional songs for a while, and recently released an album of them called Hermetic Tradition. I really like that he's preserving antiquated stories in this way. Songs about trains and railroads, praising Jesus, and this one, Henry Lee, about hiding the body of an unfaithful man who's been stabbed to death by his fiance. I should point out that it's still windy and cold. That's why Blake's playing with this weird sense of urgency. Still, I really like it. I then visit two of my favorite expats, who move to Portland because they absolutely love it here, but rarely leave their home. This is Wells, and this is what she does for a living. Okay. Um, this is a series I did on myths, and I did them as pillows because I like subverting fine art into something practical, but I also like that these are kind of <coughs> fantasy dream-like images and stories. Her embroidery is really intricate and fascinating, and I've asked her to show me some of her recent work. <clears throat> kind of a foray into exploring fame and celebrity. So this is the Minotaur. You know, the Minotaur is famous. Um, other people aren't. <laughs> the Jonas Brothers aren't. <laughs> so this is the first one. I like the design. I'm not super happy with it. This was one of the first ones I did, so it's, it looks kind of primitive to me. But um, I've done this. I'm doing this one again right now in a different kind of format. This one was the first one I did in the myth series, and that's Astro or this is uh, Acteon and Artemis, when uh, he she turns him into a stag and his hounds tear him apart, and uh, that's the mountain where she was. So all the things I do, I try to like reference what's hap what's actually happening in the story. So I changed the origin of the stamp to actually match where the story happened. Mytilene is the capital of the island of Lesbos. Nobody ever takes the time to look these things up, I have to tell them, which annoys me. Um, and I haven't, obviously I haven't finished it, I haven't sent it out. I still have to do the little like filigree and that sort of thing. But this is part of my Versus series. So this is Klaus Kinski versus Werner Herzog. The years they've worked together. Um, a lot of times when I do these two as separate, when I do them as diptychs, I'll do like Kinski's life and death and where they're from, and I have photos of those. Um, and the next one is going to be Tesla and Edison. I have a whole series of them that I'm working on, but people keep ordering this one, so it's hard to get the other ones finished. This and this are part of my series. I'm doing a bunch of, like, kind of nature, naturalistic images. So these are Ernst Haeckel illustrations that I've embroidered. Um, <clears throat> this one's not finished yet, obviously. It still has a lot of work to do, like all the white's going to get filled in. The only thing that's actually done as far as stitching goes are these little bubbles. That's it. The rest of it is still in process. This one's done. And this one actually, the dots glow in the dark, which is kind of cool. And I've been working on it for about two months. It will probably take another two months to do. This one took about six weeks, mostly because of the knots. These are different trilobites that I embroidered on. I, I distressed gold silk and then dyed it so that it looks like that kind of sandstone fossil. <clears throat> I've gotten a lot of nice responses about that. People really like that piece. Embroidering on silk is really, really hard to do because really? everything fades, so it's like, it kind of ruined my eyes. I had to start wearing glasses because I'm old. <laughs> and then this is uh, going to be, this is one of 25 pieces for an installation. And I want it to be kind of, whether you can't tell if it's, pond scum or moss or if it's an aerial view mm -hmm. so different pieces are going to reflect that they're going to be a little bit more specific to either like an aerial view or specific to just kind of looking like moss so the first time I showed that I had it hung on a tree and people really loved it cool. um, 
but that took forever because that's just thousands and thousands and thousands of teeny tiny knots you know mm -hmm. and that's only like I think this is a four inch hoop so the hoops are going to go from three inches to 11 inches oh do you want to show me the, the little cootie catcher oh yeah and then I made a bunch of cootie catchers um, <clears throat> And they had like quotes from erotic literature inside because they're cootie catchers, which I thought was really funny. So most of the early ones had Delta of Venus quotes in them, but these are hand embroidered and quilted. And this one has um, quotes from What's Your Fantasy? So it works just like a regular cootie catcher. Like you give a number, pick a color, and then when you open it, you've got ludicrous quotes embroidered inside which I thought was pretty funny. So I'm sending this off to uh, for a trade, a swap that I organized where it's all pornographic or not safe for work or rude, bad taste stuff. So this is going off to London. Um, <laughs> and then John's I Fucked Dolphins piece, He's that's his piece that he's sending off. <laughs> See, I know that we've sort of already had these conversations. But, uh -oh. This is Wells' husbandish, John. Sort of like why you moved out here? It's just really nice up here, really pretty, and, and there's actually stuff to do here, you know, um, if you want, or you don't have to do anything. You know, there's obviously like a, a music scene up here, but it seems like the weird, the biggest, two biggest things up here are stand-up comedy and karaoke. Mm -hmm. Like, people take their karaoke really seriously up here. As compared to Dallas, it's like stuff to do, it's great. I mean, there's a lot of amazing stores and the food is really good, and, you know, I like to eat. They moved here together from Dallas, and are both flourishing creatively. Also, she does practically everything by hand, down to spinning her own yarn. I knit, I do sculptural knitted pieces, and I, I spin, and I, I do it all by hand. It's really tedious. Spindles have been, they're tools that have been around for 30,000 years. You know, spinning wheels are relatively new. They're like the iPod of the textile industry. But I guess knitting is what really kind of got me into the idea of subverting a traditional craft. I got really into two-headed animals, and I wanted them to look kind of creepy, not so toy-like. So this is an original design, and I did uh, two-headed rabbits. I've done two-headed octopuses, uh, two-headed fish. The two-headed birds are kind of my favorite because they look so creepy. And then again, it's interesting. It's like I can't sell those as anything other than fine art pieces because they take so long. It's such a tremendous amount of work mm -hmm. from the spinning to the knitting to the to the fulling to the to the dyeing all of it. It takes months and months and months and months. Mm -hmm. And then people look at it and they're like, that's a toy. I'm not paying, you know, that much for a toy. And you're like, that means I get paid $2 an hour mm -hmm. for that piece. How does, how does being in Portland relate to that? I think they're there. just like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird because I'm doing kind of the same thing I was doing, I'm doing here as I was in Texas, but here I have more of a presence, you, you know, online and in public. Um, I think people here are just more interested in it, whereas people in Texas I think are more, or at least in Dallas, and even in Austin, I mean Austin's all about putting on your weird suit, but there's nothing really authentic about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that they're, they're way into kind of you know, what's what's marketed as cutting edge or interesting, but there's not a lot of thought behind it. And it seems like, the, the, you know, there's lots of hipsters here, but they seem less annoying for some reason. I don't really, and maybe it's just me that I, I don't mind them as much anymore, but like as compared to living in Brooklyn, where it's just like ultimate hipster central, like where all the, you know, super new trends start there and they radiate out. It's like here, it's people, you know, are like that, but they're just don't, they don't seem to, to wear it like a, like they don't, like I'm gonna put on my weird costume and go outside like they do in, in Austin and places like that, you know, mm -hmm. it's like everyone seems to be doing their own thing and they're real supportive, like of the few music shows I played here, people really, really, you know, I got a really good response and people came up and asked for like information and stuff afterwards where, you know, I had to play for a year in New York before anyone said anything nice, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I think here people are more involved in the arts and not from a kind of like I need to decorate my guest house perspective so I think I get more respect out here for that and I think that people kind of understand my my idea my process a lot better than than they did in Texas Portland's just really really pretty and nobody ever gets murdered and I like that <laughs> the main thing 
really, it sounds lame, but the main reason it was just the weather. I couldn't take the fucking heat in Dallas anymore and the humidity. It was just so awful. You know, there's maybe three or four days a year where it's in the high 90s and the rest of the time it's 80s and 70s. And people always say that, it, you know, it just rains nonstop here. But I think that's like the the lie they tell to keep people from moving here. You know, it's like, don't move there. It rains all the time. But it doesn't. It's beautiful. The people here are really friendly and really nice in, in the same way, like in a Texas way, in a south southern way. You know, just uh, everyone smiles and says thank you and shit. Unlike when I lived in New York, where everyone just wants to murder you with their eyes, you know. Oh, um, did did you get John into embroidery? Yeah, John. Um, John gets real antsy and real cabin fevery, and it would drive me crazy. And so, so I took some of his comics and. Uh, transfer them to, to uh, cloth and gave him a hoop and some thread and he started embroidering and then um, and then he got <clears throat> well the thing is is like uh, John you know started the man embroidery thing which is like spotlight spotlighting men who do traditionally female things which is awesome but I mean he's he does really you know interesting unique stuff that's completely his style and it appeals to people because it's really offensive like jokes about and like people in Genesis t-shirts huffing spray paint so um, so he gets interviewed all the time and I get real jealous <laughs> but I'm proud of him you know he's he's more famous than me at everything so that's okay <laughs> Behind every great man, there's a great woman. <laughs> it's a big craft, you know, uh, new craft city. They have lots of like mar like uh, Saturday markets and <laughs> yarn stores and shit like that, you know. Um, and a lot of the big names in uh, in the new craft movement are either from here or have lived here at one point. And um, it just seems like there's more in a weird way it seems like there's more free time if that makes any sense to do stuff you don't feel as pressured here you know the pace is a little bit slower which is nice um it gives you time to kind of do whatever you want you know and it's it's a lot smaller so it doesn't take you an hour to get everywhere for wells and john art for a living is a reality in portland something that is much more difficult to achieve in dallas as i visit friends here and see what they are up to I get the sense that being creatively productive is somehow easier in Portland. Maybe it is just more widely encouraged. But it's as if there's something in the air that allows artists to breathe better. They seem noticeably less stifled. We are on our way to a venue where Blake's going to play a show. I feel like I'm seeing what I came here to find. We're just on the highway listening to music, but there's a certain feeling in this shot. This is Blake Mackey in his element. His shows are really unique. They're intimate, funny, and sometimes disturbing. Oh, it's about good time for another painting. The illiterate goddamn peasant can write words. Those are pinball machines in the background. Take the virgin mind and go ahead and plant your image. When his next snaps, that'll be the last thing the sacrifice remembers. Broken 
Kleenex, yeah, it's all sex and death. As the victim climaxes, bleeding conjures them all into the front of either horse pants. <laughs> Told you it was a serious big deal. <laughs> I moved up here with a girl and I broke up with her and I had to deal with this when I moved here and so my only comfort was uh, trying to find a new job, a sleep, and this book that I was writing and Texas told me to move back but I didn't, I didn't want to give up, I couldn't and it, it was beautiful when I moved here, it was a winter wonderland there was snow all about and I would walk every day after finding, like looking up at waking 4.30 in the morning, it was it was really nice and just I wasn't really able to get out except to go get coffee or not coffee but tea in the morning and so I um, I did that uh, very many times. I wanted to go out, I really wanted to explore but I wasn't able to and um, since I was in such a weird sort of uh, depressive state of what I, I needed solaceness, I needed solace and here uh, I was able to really find that I was able to be myself and um, just that's how many people are here they're not they're not really uh, some people there are outlandish people out there but here if you really do try to find people to work with you really can it's and it's uh, and like I wrote down and I um, every day here I end up saying I love life for some reason it's just it really is a pretty amazing place Why if I sing along? What are you gonna sing? I don't know. Something not crude. Oh, okay. Well, you want? Is there something particular you want to sing? No, I'll just make it up. You sure you want anything in a? Do you, uh, do you How about a blues or something? Okay, we'll do blues. Is that okay, or would you prefer something? Uh, no, I don't. Person? I don't prefer anything. Okay, let's try that. I'll do the first one. I don't even know what to say here. He just started going and I was so thrown off guard that my jaw dropped and I couldn't stop filming. My sincerest apologies go out to this poor violinist. And to those of you watching this, I'm so sorry. I can't find my car, I can't find my dog, I can't find my woman, I can't find my wife, I can't find my dog, I can't find my car. Oh, where did I put my keys? I put my keys in my pocket. Where'd my keys go, man? Where'd my pocket go? Where did my wife go? Where did my car go? I can't find my keys, man. Where can I go? Where can I go? I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead, I'll just go right down to the key. Store. I'll get another key, I'll get another key, and I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go to the key store, I'll go to the locksmith, but I can't find my keys, I'll go to the key store, and I'll go to the locksmith, one day I'll find my keys, I'll go to the locksmith, one day I'll find my keys, I'll go to the locksmith, one day I'll find my wife, I'll go to the locksmith, one day I'll go to the key store, and I can't find my wife, I'll go to the wife store, I'll go to the dog store, I'll go to the 
car store. I'll go, I'll go, 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 go. And I need new shoes, I need new heels, I need new shoelaces for my big boots. And why do I wear shoelaces on my boots? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. They're cowboy boots, they don't need shoelaces. I just do whatever these faces will turn about and look at and say, that's funny. What's that guy doing? Singing to a violin, violin, a violin. Well, 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 I can't find my dog wife Key's car house. Wife? That's <laughs> great. Thanks. Here's one of Blake's songs to help you recover from that. Blake's friends Becky and Jeremy, who play together in the group All Holy Family. It's an intimate evening, each of them taking turns playing some of their own songs, and sometimes accompanying one another. But for some reason, there's an awkward undertone here. I feel very much like an outsider, and I can't tell Blake and Susie feel the same way. Maybe as Texans, we are too different from them. We don't exactly speak the same language. They're from Idaho, and very soft-spoken and reserved. It seems like we're having trouble communicating. Thank <laughs> you. 
tricks to sling Word bits to the brambles I scatter, scree to gather shade No, they need them Peasants have the best dreams Sappers mess their fantasies I meet up with several more Texan friends. This is Nate, a fantastic musician and expat Texan transplant. <laughs> nice. But what I'm what I'm really curious about is 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 really why. Uh, you know, so many of our friends have, have chosen Portland as a home. Uh, do you? Have, I mean, do you have any family here? No. You don't. No. So you're and you're from Texas, right? Yeah. So, you know, what what compelled you to move here? Oh, it was an accident. Really? Mm-hmm. I mean, I had I had some friends that were um, that were living here and that had lived here. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, an old roommate of mine that uh, never got along with all that well from Denton. She was living up here. When I left Texas, I went to uh, went to Indianapolis, followed a girl there, saved up enough money to uh, to move to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, things didn't didn't really work out there, and I was ready to move back to Texas. But uh, that's when I got a call. From these these friends of mine that I knew I knew from Denton, and, uh, and they're like, "Oh, we're in this band, and you'd be perfect for it with all the crazy effects pedals and all that shit." And uh, yeah, so I was, they were like, well, "We'll drive to San Francisco and uh, pick up you and your stuff." And uh, I, I sat down. That's five and a half years ago. <laughs> You've been out here five and a half years. Mm -hmm. A little over, actually. Really. Mm-hmm. So you ended up just kind of accidentally following friends out here? Yeah, I mean, I came up here to play in that band, but that uh, that band was not very good, so it ended quickly, but mm -hmm. I just stayed. She moved out of the house, and I took over her spot on the lease. 
Okay. And then uh, just been living here since then. I mean, does it appeal to you in general? Portland? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I love it. It's, it's the easiest city I've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the easiest place to live and easiest as far as get along with people and and all that stuff too. This is my good friend Andrew, also a fantastic musician and a beautiful man. He doesn't want to be interviewed, so he plays for me instead. He moved here from the Dallas area three years ago, and of course he loves it. Later we go out for drinks and I have a long overdue conversation with another great musician and sailor named Ethan Bell. We haven't actually met before this night, but have been aware of one another for years. I'll be returning to Texas tomorrow and he offers me some final insight. People that have traveled from other cities and migrated around them. In Portland you're never going to meet somebody that's actually from Portland until you live here and actually hang out with folks. For the most part you're going to run into other people that have migrated here from the Midwest or and the same in Seattle, I experienced that. It took me a long time to ever meet somebody that was actually from Seattle. Yeah. Well, why don't you make it clear that, that, that you don't live here, right? No, I do not live here. And you just, where, explain your situation. Uh, well, I'm a merchant marine, and I work on vessels. And I've been doing that for the last uh, three or four years. Um, for how long? The last three or four years. Really? Yeah, and I fell into that when I moved to Seattle after leaving Texas. I uh, started working on boats, and I moved back to Texas, and then I moved back to Seattle, and then I moved to Portland earlier uh, this year on a, for just four months, and then I moved back to Texas mm -hmm. again. But in between all that, I've been working on boats, and uh, my lifestyle and my career has afforded me the freedom to not actually live anywhere because I'm on boats most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you feel about Texas now? Being on oh, I love it. I love Texas. I'll always love Texas. I was born there, always went back there. Like, when I lived in Europe, I would always come back every summer to visit. And at that time, when I was a kid, it was a foreign place to me because I was used to Germany. But um, the visits, as I got older, were more frequent. When I graduated high school, the only place I thought I should go was Texas since I was from there. And just always knew that I wanted to go to the States for college, so I ended up at UNT because uh, my sister went there uh, many years before I did because she's nine years older than I am. Mm -hmm. So I just ended up there and uh, had a blast in all the years that I lived in Denton, plus 
my family came back, and now my dad's retired, and he has a cattle ranch. And no matter where I go in the world, I always want to go back to Texas. That's that's unique. I mean, do you, do you know, well, obviously, you don't live here, but, you, but the people that you know who do live in Portland from Texas, mm -hmm. uh, how do you think Texas factors into their minds? Um, I don't know very many people in Portland. I know a lot more in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of... Uh, Texas uh, expa expats or whatever you call them, mm -hmm. people from Texas that moved up to Seattle, and I could say stuff about that, but here, out of the very few that I know, that's be Andrew, Nate, and I'm not really from Texas, but my family that spread out across Texas has, they were cattle ranchers, and mm -hmm. um, so I got to see more of Texas than maybe they got to see, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say that that then around. Right. But, and during my time in Denton, when I was going to college there, I drove all over the damn state. I've seen all of it except for Big Ben. Is it and yeah, so that's plus just I've like traveled my mom a lot more than that in my life. I've been to a lot of countries. I love it. But maybe for them, they grew up there, went to high school there, and that's an experience I didn't get. So possibly... Them coming up here to Portland, it's um, maybe they have more to uh, run away from than I do, because I don't really have much to run away from in Texas. Right. I think that's and a really good point. I think I think really getting away from the way you grew up is a big thing. It can be, depending on how many places you've traveled worldwide. I mean, compared to my travels abroad, this city is not all that different from Dallas or Austin. Really? Especially Austin. I mean, Austin's the blue city of Texas, right? And so, in your, in your, from your perspective, this is by no means dramatically different from Dallas, Texas, or any other American city. No. It isn't. I mean,. I've given a friend shit for uh, for calling places off too quickly. Not necessarily Texas, but just any any place. You know, when they go travel someplace for the first time, and they're like, "I don't like this place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like the way I want it to look." To me, every place is worth seeing, and every place has got its merit because why? People live there, and they're doing something there. And there's places that might be better for your own personality, but to just simply say, oh, this place sucks and this place is great. Mm -hmm. well, why? What do you get? Portland indeed has a unique feel to it, and because it is especially welcoming, many of my moments here remind me of home. Take Woody, for example. This dog belongs to Blake's roommate. Woody reminds me a lot of my dog, Frank. I know that wasn't much of a point. I really just wanted to show the dogs. Okay, I'll try to make my point. I guess this is the thing about Portland. The people here really care about their city and about the quality of their environment. The streets, the buildings, houses, yards, sidewalks, businesses, all are visibly well taken care of. And there's a lot of pride in that. People are active and happy here. There's little crime. Everyone walks or rides a bike. They go out to shows, events. They participate. People grow things like at this neighborhood cooperative garden, and they get together at this co-op farmer's market. From what I experienced, Portland really is like a utopia. It's enclosed and simple and refined. Granted, you can find this in almost any city. Here, people are just really into this kind of thing. In Dallas, you get something more like this. Okay, this is at the state fair again. I'm just generalizing for lack of footage. But this is more representative of Dallas. It's more complicated. There are more people here, and it's just not as simple as Portland.
What are you thinking right now? My Portland trip is over, and I'm home for Halloween. This is my beautiful girlfriend, Annika, and our dog, Frank. It's good to be back in Dallas. Uh, Dallas is real and complicated, and it's not so sheltered. It's diverse, and it's sometimes dangerous. We really like it here. We're both artists. Um, we don't make a living off of it, but we're happy where we are. Keys car house.